Okay, although people are still trickling in, I will start now the, the presentation. So welcome everybody to the fifth of the Athena X-ray Advances AST and ACO Science Webinars on the behalf of the Athena Community Office and the Athena Science Study Team. So these webinars are intended to extend and update the scientific case for Athena, focusing on new on, on the science case, science case of Athena and focusing on exciting new ideas and developments. In this case, the excitement comes from Elisa's, Elisa Constantin's talk on AGM feedback and the connection between his and Athena. So before she starts, let me introduce her. Elisa got her PhD in 2004 at the Ludwig Maximilian University at NMP in Munich. Then she went to become a postdoc at Utrecht University and then became a junior research scientist at Strong Netherlands Institute for Space Research in 2008 and then senior research scientist there in 2015, where she still works. Her research interests are very broad and include the physical process in active electron nuclei, interstellar dust physical and chemical properties, X-ray binary spectral properties, and future X-ray emissions. And that's where it takes us here because she's deeply involved in Hidden and Athena. She's the PI for the Dutch Swiss Instrument and Science Contribution to Hidden and within Athena. She's a member of the Athena Science Study Team and co i of the XIFU. And Elisa, whenever you wish. Thank you. Um, right. Okay. I assume that you all see everything and you hear me all right. Um, okay, well, thanks a lot for uh, this invitation to talk about uh, one of our favorite subjects, AGN feedback. So let's get started if we can. Let me see. Yeah, here we go. All right, so the outline consists on very, uh, uh, very simple uh, questions. Is uh, The first one is uh, why do we care about outflows and how do they look like? And so this will be the main body of this talk and uh, what we can do about the still open questions, both using the uh, present instrumentation and how uh, the future looks like. All right, importance of outflows. Huh? So I'm, I'm sure that when there was the first detection of uh, uh, an X-ray uh, warm absorber, people didn't suspect uh, that in few years, uh, outflows uh, would become so important. So it turned out uh, that uh, outflows are uh, important, I would say fundamental, to understand uh, many uh, physical processes uh, from uh, uh, you know, a very small scale close to the black hole up to uh, cosmological distances. So starting from this, the smaller scale uh, near the black hole, ejection, so in the form of outflows, uh, actually constitutes, uh, you know, the balance between with accretion and uh, uh, guarantees uh, the black hole survival itself. So it's, uh, uh, it helps with the self-sustenance of the black hole system. And then uh, these uh, uh, outflows, of course, uh, they are uh, rich in uh, in metals, so they they uh, they, uh, they are uh, rich in um, atoms, and so then uh, they can go and enrich the host galaxy. And uh, what theorists uh, theorists also hope uh, is that uh, these outflows go much beyond that uh, and enrich the intercluster medium and the intergalactic medium. Um, so in the years, uh, it was also clear that uh, outflows must constitute the link between the innermost regions, so the black holes, uh, and, uh, and the host galaxy itself. So as we all know, there is this tight uh, um, uh, correlation between the mass of the black hole and, uh, and the velocity dispersions of stars in the bulge of galaxies. It's a very, very tight correlation that holds uh, um, over a broad parameter space. And so there must be something going on. So what people think is that uh, outflows uh, really link the innermost region with the outermost region and they regu help regulating the star uh, forming in, in, uh, in the host galaxy. So uh, regulating basically the size of the galaxy. Uh, so you see that, uh, you know, um, outflows uh, 
are very, very important, but not only. So if we go out from, you know, the local environment of a galaxy and we expand to, you know, the old galaxies that we have in the universe, um, the luminosity function of galaxies and that we see here in this plot. So it's like, you know, how many galaxies you have in a certain, in a certain volume for a certain luminosity as a function of, uh, of the luminosity itself cannot be explained if you don't put uh, a little bit of feedback in it. So uh, the feedback that is uh, required is, is quite modest, uh, is 0.5 to 5%, but it's absolutely necessary because as you can see in this plot, if we, put, if we uh, exclude feedback from the model, and this is the dashed uh, red line, uh, this, you know, the, the model can also absolutely not fit uh, the observed data. Uh, so it is absolutely paramount important to uh, understand, you know, the outflows that we observe uh, every day and, uh, and understand if theory, so uh, theory of course relies a lot on feedback, is supported by observations. All right, so um, outflows, so there exist of, you know, many kinds. Uh, every different flavors that you want. Uh, and of course, our mind needs to put them in order. Okay, so then here I put them in order of what we think is their distance scale as a function of distance from, from the black hole. So you find the black hole, which is actually here in blue on the right hand side of, of this slide. And then the first in line are ultra fast winds. They, are, uh, they should be disk winds the, located at subparsec scale. Uh, with uh, uh, that, that are speeding up uh, enormously. So they uh, have a velocity that should be a fraction of the velocity of light. Moving uh, a little bit farther away, but not that much because we are still at subparsec scale, we have episodic mass ejection, uh, also called obscures. So uh, these are um, um, episodes that happen from time to time in a, a uh, in an active galaxy, and uh, uh, the velocities uh, implied by these obscures is of the order of thousands of kilometers per second. Okay, so now we move even farther away and we go to the warm absorbers that here I abbreviated with WA. And uh, uh, so these are uh, uh, gas uh, components that we studied ever since Chandra and XMM were launched. We know that their velocity ranges uh, from the hundreds to the thousands kilometers per second. And we, uh, when we think that their radius should be at parsec scale, more or less. So we also know everything about their uh, you know, connection with the UV absorbers, because also in the HST band, we see these absorbers and many of these components are the same. And, uh, and then fast forward to kiloparsec scale, we have the galactic warm absorbers uh, that are really located farther away from the black hole, but they, they are still photoionized. So let's try to have an overview of all these components and try to understand them better. Uh, but before that, um, I just want to give you a flavor of um, uh, you know, how the future instruments, and hopefully we will have all of them, uh, will help us in this quest. And, uh, and it will be also clear that everything that seems very, very hard right now to solve uh, with future instruments uh, would be you know, our, our everyday job. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have uh, the plot of the effective area that we have seen a million of times. We know that Athena, that is the black line, will, uh, uh, will have the largest of the effective areas at all energies. Uh, CRISM will be specialized in the, in the harder energies, uh, and, and it's here highlighted by the red line. And uh, uh, so here I didn't plot Arcus, but should be uh, more or less three times the RGS uh, effective area that is um, plotted here in green. So the three instruments that I will be talking about are CRISM, uh, that should be launched in the first half of 2023. Arcus is a concept mission um, and, uh, uh, and Athena that we all know and love. Uh, on the right hand side, uh, we have the resolving power. So how, how much uh, these instruments are able to distinguish narrow features. Um, 
so the higher the number on the y-axis, the better the, the performing the instrument is, as you can imagine, and as a function of energy. So RGS, Meg, and Hag were the gratings on board the XMM and Chandra, and they are specialized in the soft energies. And uh, Athena and Chrisma will be uh, dealing with the, uh, all the energies that are above uh, one or two kV. Arcos, on the other hand, is a little bit, uh, you know, outside this parameter space and will have a very, very high resolving power in the soft uh, X-ray band going down to the carbon edge, so 0 0.28 uh, kV. All right, um, so let me show you how they would perform uh, um, uh, in the future compared to what we have now. So here I have a, a PN spectrum, and uh, so looks like a, a quite uneventful spectrum, but in reality, in this simulation, I put two warm absorbers, one obscure, one UFO, and plus emission lines. And so all the components that we have seen in slide number two or three. And you see that, uh, you know, there is very little to understand here. Uh, while with CRISM, that hopefully, you know, in one year time, uh, we will be playing with the data. Um, uh, we will have uh, at expenses of a very uh, of, of a, a slightly less effective area than EPIC PN, uh, an enormous amount of details uh, at medium and high energy. Of course, if you go to uh, Athena, you know, everything will be improved, resolution and effective area. So this will allow us to investigate many more of the faintest sources and also uh, spectroscopically disentangle very, very complicated regions. All right, so let me also spend two words on Arcos. Uh, Arcos will be a grating, so uh, uh, not a calorimeter. We'll be, you know, uh, dealing with, with uh, we will be dealing with dispersive uh, spectroscopy. And uh, the PI is Randall Smith at uh, CFA. And of course, it is not an approved mission, but you know we like it very much because there is a high resolution spectroscopy, which is uh, the key to study um, outflows. So here in the simulation, I put you know, a six component warm absorber. Uh, that is the result of a large campaign of a very bright uh, Seifert one uh, observed with RGS plus galactic absorption. And with a moderate uh, exposure time, we can see that Arcosa, which is the red line here in the bottom panel, will be able to uh, significantly detect all of these components. And if we increase the exposure time, uh, we will be able to do velocity result spectroscopy as we do with HST. This is outside the reach of RGS and LATGS that are also uh, shown here in this plot. All right, so if you remember the uh, sketch that we have seen before, near the black hole, we have ultra fast outflows. So these are highly ionized, high column density, uh, very much variable. So sometimes you see them, sometimes you don't see them, and a very, very high outflow velocity. Um, so their velocity has been recorded to be up to 0 0.2, 0 0.4, the velocity of light. Um, Studying samples of bright uh, AGNs, it has been estimated that about 30% of AGNs should host a, a UFO. This is a very famous example. This is PDS-456. Uh, and the interesting thing about that, of course, there are you know, uh, countless examples of uh, UFOs. But the, the interesting thing about that is that uh, these authors uh, um, uh, connected absorption with the mission. So in, they interpreted the spectrum in terms of a P-signy profile. So it means that there is something that is outflowing on, uh, uh, along your line of sight, but then there is also emission happening on, on a wider um, uh, opening angle. So they estimated this opening angle, and uh, which should be quite large. Putting everything together, absorption and emission, uh, and the, the outflow velocity that should be 0 0.25 C, the kinetic, velocity, the kinetic luminosity over the total luminosity of the source should be 20%. 
So this should be compared with the 0.55% that is necessary to these cosmological uh, models. And we see that we are definitely in this ballpark. Of course, UFOs, we don't know the duty cycle of UFOs. So we don't know if they are always there and uh, you know if they are in every source. So 20% is a good result, but we don't know yet if it is sufficient. All right, so continuing with UFOs, UFOs traditionally were uh, studying in the uh, um, iron K alpha um, region. So only iron 26 and iron 25 would, observe, would, would be observed. But recently, also low ionization UFOs have been reported. So these are UFOs that show up in, uh, in the lower ionization ions like oxygen 7, oxygen 8, and so detectable in the RGS band and also in the Chandra band. Um, so the curious thing, for example, uh, about this particular source that I show here is that it was detected in a spiral galaxy that was dubbed as the Milky Way twin. So um, this, warm, the, this uh, uh, UFO, low ionization UFO, could also have a CO and a radio counterpart. Um, so there was a lot of speculation about, uh, about, uh, about this. So uh, people asked, like, yeah, are we seeing feedback in action? Um, can it be that you know, this low ionization UFO reaching the host galaxy could be you know, the precursor of what we see he, uh, now in the Milky Way in the form of a Fermi or Erosita bubble. Um, so there is a lot to study about this uh, low ionization UFO because we don't know, for example, if it is accompanied by a, a higher ionization a UFO and, uh, or if it, if it is part of a, of a shock gas and what is the relationship between you know, the disk uh, outflows uh, and, uh, you know, and, and the host galaxy. Okay, uh, so uh, you remember, of course, that there was a lot of controversy about these UFOs, if they were real or not. Uh, and, uh, um, and so people uh, uh, asked themselves uh, if uh, the, um, uh, these UFOs that we see in the X-rays could have an HST counterpart. So of course, um, HST and in particular COS, the instrument uh, um, aboard the HST, have uh, a signal to noise and, uh, and, uh, and a resolution that is unbeatable. So if we see a UFO in that band, of course, uh, you know, we con should consider it you know, like a, 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 a very, very relevant result. So uh, what, for example, Jerry Chris did was to look for the uh, UV counterpart of the UFO seen in the historical, perhaps the first example of UFOs, so PG-1211. And uh, where to look for this UFO? In the, in the top panel, uh, we see uh, the uh, blue wing of the broad emission lines line from the uh, Lyman alpha. So you see the steep rise is basically the, you know, the shoulder of this Lyman alpha. And uh, you see you know, a lot of absorption here, which is uh, 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 not relevant in this case. It's uh, warm absorbers, uh, intergalactic or interstellar medium lines. But here you see that uh, there is a Lyman alpha uh, absorption highlighted here. And this is the zoom in of this, uh, uh, of this absorption. And you see that is broad, so it's not as narrow as the others. And uh, uh, the velocity wise, which is here at the top, is consistent with the, the absorption that people saw in the X-rays. But not, not in every case you can see a UV um, absorption counterpart. Because of course, if you are too much ionized, you, would, you wouldn't see the Lyman alpha counterpart. So you, you don't need to be too ionized. And also uh, the observation needs to be simultaneous with the X-rays uh, because we know that UFOs are highly variable. And uh, uh, so it is difficult to see, that, to, see, to see this feature in historical data, for example. Um, so since then, since this first example, of course, uh, people have been actively uh, looking for you know, the, the, the proof uh, in, the, in the HST um, spectrum of the UFO that we see in the X-rays. All right, so, well, of course, there is no light without darkness. And uh, 
since the uh, six to eight kV region is very crowded, people have argued a lot, uh, have, you know, debated a lot on the existence of these uh, uh, UFO features and, and whether they are these queens or not. So the region is understandably very crowded and, and very complicated because, of course, uh, we have a very limited resolution there. So there are emission lines, multiple emission lines, uh, warm absorbers, normal warm absorbers, UFOs, and reflection features. Um, so what, uh, for example, Gall Gallo and Fabian uh, um, thought uh, in a series of papers is that the same features that mimic a UFO uh, could also be produced uh, not by a disc wind, but if you have, for example, material in and above the disc and uh, uh, for different disc. So the, the different disc inclinations would, would, would produce uh, different features. And here is an example. This is iron 25 and iron 26 in a blanket configuration. So all the disc is uh, covered by highly ionized material for different uh, uh, inclination of the disc. As, uh, uh, and, and these are is highlighted by different colors here. Uh, so uh, also different configurations of clumpiness would also produce this, uh, this absorption uh, features. Uh, so people have looked into it. Uh, so possibly all features could, could be at play, complicating, far, uh, complicating further uh, the situation. Um, but of course, un, uh, until we have low resolution, um, this, 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 this matter cannot be easily solved. Uh, but luckily enough, they have uh, both the UFO scenario and uh, you know, the resonant um, absorption and scattering uh, have observables uh, that will be distinguishable uh, as soon as we have uh, a calorimeter in place. Uh, so this was also illustrated by uh, Didier and Massimo in, in a recent paper. So you know, soon we uh, we could have the definitive uh, answer uh, to this question, and you know how the UFOs coexist with all the features that we have in the uh, iron region. Okay, so uh, we have dealt with the UFOs now. We have we have the obscures that are just a little bit farther away. All right, so obscures are not permanent features of AGNs. And, uh, uh, and um, so this is the, the first uh, um, uh, case where the obscure was identified as such. There were also examples before that, but the novelty here is that we had uh, um, simultaneous HST coverage. So we will see in a second why that was important. NGC 5548 was one of these classical, very bright seifert uh, characterized by a high flux, uh, multi-component warm absorber. And this was, it is highlighted here in green uh, where the Chandra 2002 data are displayed. So this is what people expected to see. But in 2013, during a long XMM campaign, the soft X-ray spectrum was heavily suppressed. You see that only the emission lines uh, uh, survived. While uh, you know, the spectrum uh, recovered its flux uh, in, the, in the hard X-rays uh, and also new star and integral show a normal Seifert once at, at, uh, at those energies. So there was something obscuring, but what was it? All right, so the answer came again from uh, the HST spectrum. Uh, so this is a detail of uh, um, the carbon-4 broad emission line. So this is actually a doublet. And uh, uh, the green line uh, displays uh, the line as it should be, as we expected it. But we see that in reality, and these are the, uh, uh, this is the, the, the black line, the um, blue side of this line is totally eaten up by a very broad absorption rather than narrow. You see also the narrow features here that has nothing to do with the obscure. So the, the broad absorption actually revealed to us uh, the um, covering factor of the absorber, the ionization, and the outflow velocity. Um, all right, so then this was definitely a, an obscurer outflowing at thousands kilometers per second. 
ever since, um, there were uh, many dedicated campaigns uh, to catch uh, famous sources in, in an obscured state. So we know that the obscure is, uh, uh, can last days, but also years, and is definitely structured and uh, you know, uh, full of details. So they have different covering factors, uh, different stratification and ionization. Here I show among the many examples that we have seen in the literature, another example, NGC 3783, another famous source that usually is unobscured. So this is the, the black line here in the top panel. This is the spectrum as we expected. And the blue and the red are uh, the spectra in obscured states. You see that also in the obscured state, the spectrum can change. So this particular obscurer uh, came also with another surprise. So the surprise is here depicted in the lower panel when we see the transmission of all the absorbing components as a function of energy. So uh, we have the obscures um, that are, is a two component obscure in black and red. So these are quite featureless um, uh, components. Then we have the deionized warm absorber which is here at the bottom and in blue. And we will see in a second what it means to be deionized. And uh, um, we see also that a high, um, high ionization component appeared only when the obscure appeared. And this is in green here. And you see you know, the uh, very prominent absorption in the iron K alpha uh, region. So this is an, a, a, an absorber uh, uh, with log psi uh, equal three, more or less. So there is a tail. And uh, um, so this is definitely uh, reminiscent of uh, an older case when you know, we didn't talk about obscures, but rather you know, broad line region uh, clouds type of obscures. So this is the case of Markarian 766 um, that was studied by uh, Risaliti. And they also saw associated with uh, these uh, periods of obscuration, um, the appearance of a, 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 a high ionization component. So what they thought their interpretation is that, uh, you know, the obscurer is actually, you know, like, a, like an onion type of configuration where you have, uh, you know, a colder uh, and higher column density components and then uh, you know, and, and, and then uh, lower and lower as you go out from the, the bulk of, of this obscure. And then you have a kind of a tail uh, that is lower density and uh, high uh, and highly ionized. Uh, so it's like it's not shielded, so then more prone to be ionized by the central source. So it is interesting to see the, uh, um, the comparison between you know, these new obscures and uh, you know, the old uh, examples. All right, so obscures were also studied in timing. And uh, we will see in a second why, you know, I uh, mentioned this timing behavior uh, of the obscure. So De Marco et al. in 2020 uh, um, also studied this 3783 data and compared the light curve of uh, the unobscured state, which is here on the left hand side for three different energy bands, and uh, with the obscured state, which is on the right hand side of this plot, again for the same three energy bands. So you see that, of course, the light curve is dramatically different. All right, so uh, what uh, she did was to produce a coherence uh, energy plot. Uh, the coherence uh, tells you uh, how much of the variance of the uh, uh, two uh, reference bands uh, can be described uh, uh, by a constant factor. So how much they are correlated. And usually they are like, you know, if you have a continuum source, uh, even if you have different continuum components, the coherence should be close to one. And this is exactly the case on the left hand side. So we have coherence and uh, the coherence is close to one as a function of energy. But when you introduce uh, your obscurer, uh, the coherence looks very different. So you see this dramatic drop in, uh, in uh, coherence very far from one. So uh, what, uh, what they did is to simulate different you know, cloudy configurations um, and they could recover 
that, uh, the, that this lack, that, that this drop in coherence was caused by an obscure with the, exactly the parameters that were uh, studied you know, in, in, uh, from the spectroscopical point of view. So coherence could also be used, timing, pure timing would, uh, could also be used to study these uh, outflow components. All right, so then if we put everything together, where is uh, this obscure? So we have seen that the obscurer is definitely able to uh, absorb the broad uh, emission uh, lines in the UV spectrum. So it must be located in front of the broad line region, but also uh, it should be located uh, uh, before the warm absorber. So this is illustrated here where the black hole is here at the, at the center. This is the observer up here and uh, we see the obscure, which is here, you know, composite because it was stratified, of course. And these are the warm absorber. And why do we know that? Because the warm absorber did uh, was consistent to be ionized uh, by uh, a, a, an obscured uh, spectral energy distribution rather than the original one, you know, the unobscured one. So then we could pinpoint uh, the location of the obscure. So what the obscurer is, we don't know. It could be ejection from the accretion disk. But what is sure now it is that all famous sources sooner or later undergo episodes of heavy obscuration. So it's definitely a new feature of this whole AGN system. Uh, okay, so we've moved farther away. We have warm absorbers. Uh, warm absorber have been characterized very well from the phenomenological point of view in the last 20 years, because as you can see in this GIF, you know, if I change the, I, the column density and the ionization parameter, the, uh, the warm absorber can be very well characterized by, you know, all sorts of line ratios. And the ionization parameter is here defined by uh, the ratio of the ionization luminosity and the density times uh, the uh, square of the radius. Uh, the density is the gas density, of course. Okay, so other observables that we have are the outflow velocity and the velocity broadening. And uh, if we are so lucky to see also emission associated with absorption, we have seen that in the case of uh, the uh, PDS 456 UFO, we can compare absorption and emission get the covering factor, opening angle, and, uh, and get the connection between emission and absorption. We also know everything about stratification and thickness of the swarm absorbers. But what unfortunately we don't know is almost everything that has to do with the physics of the swarm absorber. So we have, uh, so all these things are subjected to, to very large uncertainties. Geometrical structure, connection with the disk winds, connection with the host galaxies, and not to mention even the launching mechanism that I won't have the time to talk about. All right, so um, the radius of the swarm absorber uh, that we have seen here in, in this formula is uh, here at the bottom, is uh, um, uh, is very difficult to determine. So there are uh, there is a very quick and dirty method to uh, determine that. And one is we can get a lower limit, uh, calculating at which radius the gas uh, reaches the escape velocity. And this is just dependent on things that we can measure. And, uh, and an upper limit, uh, uh, just imposing that the thickness of the warm absorber uh, must be uh, smaller than the radius of the warm absorber. So if you put everything together, uh, classical warm absorbers uh, would be located at Toro scale. So that's why I, I located them at parsec scale. All right, so why do we need the, the radius? Uh, uh, the thing is that if we want to know about the physics of the warm absorber, uh, we want to know about the mass outflow rate. The mass outflow rate is dependent uh, um, on things that we can measure, like the column density, the outflow velocity. We can also guess the, uh, the covering fraction, but it's also dependent on the radius that we don't know. And then this m dot out, in turn, should be inserted in the kinetic luminosity. 
that we need to understand how much this kinetic luminosity compares with the bolometric luminosity and understand the feedback. All right, so the key is to understand the density of the gas. So then we know that the radius and then, uh, and then everything will be clear, hopefully. Okay, uh, so how do we determine the density? So here I describe quickly three methods, metastable levels, time resource spectroscopy, and spectral timing. All right, so uh, the UV density diagnostic is something that people do uh, frequently. So here is a spectrum, a VLT spectrum, is not yet an X-ray spectrum, where uh, luckily we see a lot of these metastable levels. Metastable levels are transitions, so are levels that are just above the ground state and they get populated by electrons only if the density is above a certain threshold. Okay, so in this case, for example, we had a lot of metastable levels. We just uh, calculate their intensity with respect to the ground state. We put them on a theoretical curve and we fit for the density. So it is very easy in words, in, on paper. But in the X-rays, uh, first of all, uh, metastable levels are very uh, weak features. There have been uh, you know, sparse evidence uh, of uh, sparse reports of uh, metastable levels seen in the X-ray binaries and AGNs. So it's unclear if we can uh, see them at all. Uh, although with a high resolution, you know, uh, th this exercise could be uh, much easier. But the problem could be that uh, the um, uh, X-rays metastable levels uh, could be um, uh, sensitive to higher densities. So density that may not even exist in AGNs. So this is illustrated here. You just have to uh, follow me because this is a very complicated plot. We have density on the y-axis as a function of log psi. So the ionizations you can see. And, uh, uh, and here I highlighted the regions where, you know, Chrisma and Athena will be uh, uh, specialized with high resolution. And you see that the elements that are, uh, that are interesting in, the, in this range uh, would be um, a tracer of relatively high densities here. So you see in this, this parameter space here. So it's not uh, yet guaranteed that we could work with uh, uh, metastable levels in the future. But density estimates through variability could be a more promising method because we would be sensitive to, um, uh, to a much broader range of densities. This is all based on the fact that the, the gas takes a bit of time to respond to variation of the central source. And this bit of time, which is due to recombination time, ionization time, is dependent on the density, is critically depending on the density. So the higher the density, as you can see that in this equation, the smaller the delay. All right, so then in the years, uh, you know, people have tried these methods uh, uh, in extensively. What you need is a very high uh, signal to noise ratio. But this is how it should work uh, in, uh, in practice. So you, you have a, a light curve at the bottom panel and, uh, and here at the uh, upper panel, we have a random uh, ion. And uh, so if we are closer to the source, this, the, the gas uh, would respond immediately. And you see that the concentration of uh, the relative concentration of this ion would just follow the light curve. But as we go farther away from the source, we are subjected to this uh, uh, recombination ionization time scale. And then we see a, a more and more delay uh, until uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the ion doesn't respond anymore. But if you put all the ions together, there will be an ideal distance that will, you know, that will best fit the observables. And so then get to uh, you know, a best fit radius. So this is also illustrated here. If we put all the ions together, um, we have the light curve as before uh, vertically displayed with, and with you know, a moderate flare, uh, a flare. So we start from before the flare, uh, in a situation here that is depicted with the normal warm absorber. When the flare appears, uh, we have a different ionization. But then when we are in a post-flare situation, the gas is not yet in equilibrium. You see very different 
features with respect to the initial conditions. So you need some time to get to equilibrium again, as depicted here. So as I said, you need a very high signal to noise to apply this uh, uh, method to current data, but it would be a great opportunity for future instruments, Athena, Arcus, they could do these things routinely. Timing spectroscopy. Um, so we know that uh, uh, reverberation is widely used to study properties of the accretion disk. And we know also that the warm absorber that is located between you know, the, the accretion disk activity and the observer also have an effect on uh, uh, time lags. But time lags uh, are very difficult to model and study. So they rely on uh, Monte Carlo simulations and a lot of assumptions. And this is illustrated, for example, in Alston uh, and collaborators. But the thing is uh, that we go back to the coherence, uh, as we have seen before. Coherence is a function of energy. So um, the, at every frequency, the coherence bears the information on the density of the gas. So these are uh, uh, Athena simulations. And, uh, um, we, uh, and we demonstrated that uh, with Athena type of instruments, uh, we could you know, study and model the coherence to look for the properties of uh, the warm absorber and in particular of the density. And this is a practical example. So if you simulate uh, an Athena spectrum with noise and everything, and, uh, uh, and for each uh, frequency, you, uh, you know, extract the uh, coherence spectrum and you fit it for density. Uh, so this is illustrated here in this map. Every, every row is a different frequency. And I'm sorry, yes, every row is a different frequency and every column is a, a reduced chi-square type of map. And you put everything together, you see that you can recover very well the, uh, the density of, uh, I'm sorry, the, the radius of the, of the, the uh, absorbing gas and as a consequence, the density. All right, so I don't think I have much time, uh, right? Uh, Francisco, how, how much time I have? 44, you still have a couple of few minutes. Few minutes. Okay, so let me illustrate uh, briefly. Um, um, for example, you know, we, we think that, you know, all now and in the future, we can, um, uh, uh, we can interpret our, our absorbers as stratified with a, a given opening angle and everything will be solved, except that is not. Some warm absorbers behave very oddly and we will have to take that into account when we have better instruments. So for example, this source uh, has two uh, warm absorber components. So this is illustrated here uh, where we plot log psi as a function of uh, the broadband luminosity on the x-axis. And these are different epochs when the source, which is one sweetie one, was observed. We always observe these two components that have the same outflow velocity and they always vary together. But the thing is that as you increase luminosity, the, uh, the warm absorber have random uh, ionization parameters. So uh, either you have to assume that they are in constant non-equilibrium, which could well be the case, um, or there is something else going on. The other strange thing is that uh, from one epoch to the other, the column density changes dramatically. These two components always vary together, but they are, they are never in pressure equilibrium. So, uh, and also in the short term variability, we have variation in column density. So long story short, uh, we had to, of course, you know, uh, devise uh, an another, uh, another uh, scenario to try to understand all these oddities in the source. And the other scenario is that the warm absorber is not actually stratified in the way that we are used to but uh, it, it works like a steaming boat. So every event that we see is an independent event that possibly comes from the same region of the uh, accretion disk because of the same outflow velocities that we see. And every time they have a different um, uh, column density and their own ionization parameter that is in equilibrium, you know, in its own situation, 
uh, because the ionization parameter depends on the density, the specific density of that specific event. So it is not radial, it is not a radial the stratification, it doesn't depend on the radius, but rather on the density. And uh, so, and the high and the low ionization gas would be two phases of the same, of the same outflowing event. And uh, um, so this clumpy, uh, this would be evidence of, uh, you know, a clumpy outflow. And, uh, uh, and this is quite different from the classical Aristotelic, Aristotelic uh, uh, type of outflow that we have in mind. Definitely, we will have to take that into account when better data will come. Okay, so this is the summary on all the elements that, uh, you know, are explained uh, uh, with this, uh, with this uh, kind of model. The last thing I want to talk about, uh, it will take only one minute, uh, is galactic warm absorbers, because we have seen that in the range of all the warm absorbers, we have also the kiloparticle scale absorbers. And, uh, and they would be located in, uh, in the galaxy itself. So uh, for broad absorption line quasars, uh, these absorbers are found to be uh, at galactic uh, uh, distances. But this example here in the X-rays is a totally normal supermassive quasar. And uh, so in, a, in this example, so it was 1H0419, uh, we had simultaneous UV uh, coverage and through metastable levels, again, we could get the density of the, of the outflow and so therefore the distance that it was three kiloparsec. So, uh, and it was definitely uh, photo ionized and not, you know, collisionally ionized. So what could this be? A relic of a nuclear fast wind? But definitely, you know, this is, you know, hot gas that resides in the host galaxy. So if you compute, you know, if uh, uh, you could see this, uh, this outflowing gas in imaging, the uh, answer is that uh, uh, this um, extended emission should come out from the Chandra PSF. And indeed, uh, a Chandra follow-up definitely show this extended emission uh, that is consistent in ionization with what we see in absorption. So we, also be, we were also able to image uh, the warm absorber, so which was uh, uh, quite unique. So uh, putting everything together is, uh, is definitely a challenge. And, and it is uh, also a challenge to understand how much altogether they contribute to feedback. So um, if we put everything in a table and we remind uh, that the um, M dot uh, outflowing, uh, the, the um, uh, mass uh, outflow rate depends on the radius, the column density and the outflow velocity. And the kinetic luminosity depends on the, on the velocity to the, uh, to the third. We get that the torus warm absorber uh, that we know in so much detail doesn't have possibly the right column density or the right radius or the right velocity to contribute massively to feedback. While uh, uh, you know what we call uh, the obscurer would have enough column density to contribute because we are talking about something in 10 to the 23, uh, but not the radius or the velocity. The galactic wind that we have just seen would definitely have the radius because it's already in the galaxy. So uh, it's definitely feedback in action. And, uh, and the ultra fast outflows have both the, col the column density and definitely the outflow velocity to contribute potentially very much to uh, the feedback. Of course, there are very many unknowns. So we don't know how these uh, components relate to each other. And uh, if the ultra fast outflows are always there or not, and if they are sufficient to uh, get the feedback necessary for theory. So this leads me to the conclusions. Uh, we know that AGN can host multiple outflows and some of them may be important for feedback. And in the future, we will have the opportunity of testing many, many uh, tools that um, we, uh, will allow us to uh, get a much better handle on feedback, the geometry of the outflow and the launching mechanism. And uh, with, the, with this, uh, I thank you very much. Great, thank you, Elisa. We know the 
Okay, thank you, Alisa. So are there any questions? I did have a, num a couple of questions, if nobody else goes. Okay. Okay, so if nobody else goes in, let, let me start. The, the image, the Chandra image, what, what is the, the scale of, of the... Now I go, wait, let me just check. Let me share it again. Uh, here we go. Oh, uh, I do not remember. Uh, actually, let me think. Huh? I think it's of the order of uh, 10 arc seconds. Could be a little bit less, perhaps. It, it's it a, I, I go by memory. Um, so what, what, what sort of PSA do, would we need in Athena to be able to do this? <laughs> oh, well, I don't know. It could be that. Uh, Mm, yes, I don't know, uh, but I don't know how in how many cases uh, an EGN host a, a kiloparsec scale uh, warm absorber, and of course you have to take into account the relative distance of the of the EGN. So this is quite far away. It is, I think, the redshift is zero point one. So for a nearby object, this exercise is definitely doable. Even uh, you know, with a moderate uh, PSF for um, Athena, for nearby yes, objects. So this was quite far away, zero point one, the redshift. So that's that's good to know. Okay, I think Judith has a question. Judith, please. Uh, hi, Elisa. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So just I was. Uh, I, don't, I don't think you mentioned this, but apologies if you did and I missed it. Um, with the the various timing spectroscopy type studies that you talked about, how 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 much of that is possible with Grism? How many objects can you look at or is, is, is that something um, where mainly mainly you need some you need different capabilities I think you mentioned Athena and Arcus for uh, for the um, uh, um, returning to equilibrium after after flares um, okay um, of course you need uh, uh, so you need the the good sources to do that so they need to vary enough and uh, usually the, the good sources are narrow line seifert ones narrow line seifert ones are not the brightest of, among the QSOs, uh, among the quasars. And uh, so then this reduces our parameter space a lot. So with Athena, you know, the signal to noise is uh, uh, usually not a problem. So that's why uh, um, also doing the coherence spectrum or time resource spectroscopy could be the norm. But with uh, CRISM, I suspected that we, we will be restricted. Uh, of course, you know, we will do the experiment, so this for sure. Um, but we will be restricted to a smaller number of sources. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Let's see. I don't see any other questions. I do have another question. Is that you, you mentioned that up to 30% of AGN are supposed to host an a UFO. Where, where does this 30% come from, I mean? Okay, so then this was a work by uh, Francesco Tombesi. Uh, and I think they, they started from a sample uh, of sources. And, uh, and I think this, this is where the statistics come from. This is observed in a sense. Yes, exactly. Ah, okay, because, but do, do you know if there are any studies of how many are detectable when we have better hardware? No, I, I, I do not know. No, I do not know. It may be better when we have a thing. Uh, may, yeah, well, for sure. Because of course now uh, a UFO, a high ionization UFO is only detectable if its column density is very, very high. Um, so, of course, we will be more relaxed on this requirement once we have better signal to noise and better resolution. Okay, thank you. Oh, I think somebody had a question. Judith, do you have another question? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I can I can ask another question if there there aren't any in the uh, in the Q and A. Um, so I was just going to ask, with the um, particularly with the kiloparsec scale outflows that you were just talking about, has there been in any effort? Um, I guess perhaps mainly with the bowel quasars to look at um, any relationship to to radio radio outflows and, and radio jets on on small scales in quasar. Mm. And um, yeah. and has anyone been, been thinking perhaps about what you can do with that? Um, so this, is, this is a good one. So this particular source uh, only had. Uh, uh, a radio coverage at, I don't remember which frequency, that would cover only the galaxy. So there wasn't any uh, um, radio coverage that, you know, was perhaps interesting for, you know, very nuclear type of, it's, it's a radio quiet, but I don't know if there was a small scale uh, type of radio emission. It's also, I think, in, in an in a odd uh, declination, so then not all Mm. All instruments can reach that. Yeah, no, they often are the nicest sources. <laughs> okay, any other questions? I don't see any, and the Slack, I don't think there are any. I can see they are aware of that, but nothing's there. Okay, so we are almost into the hour. Ah, there is one. Okay, there are no messages, no, no questions in Slack. Okay, uh, so very interesting stuff to be done in the future with whatever we have by then. Okay, so if there are no more questions, then thank you, Elisa, again. Nice to know there is a lot of things to do. <laughs> Thanks um, to you for inviting me. Thank you, everybody, for attending, and we hope to see you in the next Athena webinar.